subscribe now and press the bell icon. Never miss an update. Fourth unit in first chapter. Does anyone remember what did we do last? Hmm? Divyansh, what did we, what did Ma'am, we uh, do? Standard deduction. Okay. Uh, additional deductions. For whom? Additional deduction for whom? Addi additional deductions, uh, the, personal, uh, the person who is blind or the person who is uh, more than age of 65 years, Very they good. are getting the additional deductions, ma'am. Okay. Um, Rohit, anything else that you can add? So what is qualified, what is not qualified? Give me an example. Ma'am, qualified expenditure is like property tax, uh, rent, uh, and uh, upkeep repair, proper insurance, and uh, non qualifying expenditure is like uh, clothing, education, medical treatment, life insurance. Okay, good, good, good. Um, who can tell me about um, different kind of filing status? I can't. This is like a quick fire round. Huh? We, we are not going to wait for like it's like fastest fingers first. Muskan, filing status. Yes, ma'am. Married filing jointly and married filing separately. Okay, one more next. Vandana. Okay, she's not there. Maybe Vinita. A qualifying widower and a head of household. Very good. One more is left. Single. Yeah. Yeah, all of you guys are most of you guys are single now. Huh? And what is the what is ITIN? What is ITIN? Um, okay, how about you, sir? Ma'am, identity protection personal identification number. Who is that, Divyansh? Yes, ma'am. Oh, very good. Okay, ma'am. Six, six digit. That is the six digit number. Okay. When is it given? Does it does everyone has this number? No, ma'am. Okay. No, ma'am. Miss Miss Shobha says. Can be on mute. One of you. Sakshi, so what are the due dates for filing ten forty? Yes, um, um, for the 1040, um, for the S Corp partnership and LLC, March 15, uh, for C Corp and individual, April 15, and um, for non profits I, organization, I guess, for May 15th. Okay, good. But you won't get you know extra marks because my question was only for 1040, although you've given a lot of other things also. Okay, okay ma'am. Okay. Mm, what else? What else did we do? Okay, what are the filing? Okay, Shweta. How do we come up with filing thresholds? Self employed, then um, his uh, net earning should be $400 or more. Okay. And uh, income, if it is more than standard deduction, then they are supposed to file the return. Mm -hmm. and also, if they, one is having an unearned income over 100 uh, $1,100, then they are supposed to file the returns. Is social security included to, to like compute the pressure? No. no. Okay. Uh, what about personal uh, residence disposition gain? Sorry? Personal residence okay. disposition yeah. gain. Above five thousand dollars, then I think uh, no. So when we are doing the gross filing threshold, do we need to add that amount to come up to the threshold or not? Even though it's not taxable, mm -hmm. we need to. We need to. That remember we talked about that. That the personal exemption person may get up to five hundred thousand dollar, but that doesn't mean. That even if there is an exemption, doesn't mean that they don't have to file tax return. Okay. Tanya, what are the penalties percentage if the payroll is like more than 15 days late? 
five percent and interest three percent 15 days more than 15 days more than 15 i don't think it's five percent point five more than 15 is I, I even gave an example right if you may have to make payment of two twenty thousand dollars if you don't pay in time how much extra are supposed to pay like if you don't pay it in first 15 days tanya we have already computed a lot of those penalties for jt yeah but that was 15 percent on uh, the okay. interest gets compounded right three percent i'm not talking about interest right now i'm just talking about penalties it's 10 percent the penalty rates are 10 percent above 15 days i think um, below 15 days it's like five percent and maybe two or three percent for like first three four days or something we we had that little table we went through it okay so for for test to be a qualifying relative does what is like one of the condition you know upon satisfaction of which you can claim the person as a qualifying relative for head of household okay let's ask somebody else let's ask bhavani about this tell one of the condition how can the relative become a qualifying person for head of household category anyone can say ma'am if for more than 6 months they have to yes residency test Siddhavi, very nice. Okay, what is the other one? Yes, uh, if he is bearing all the expenses of the dependents. Okay, more than 50% of the person's total expense. And what is an exception for the parents? Parents are also relatives, right? But there is an exception for them. Marital status. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Ma'am, it's like uh, we need not to see the, uh, the dependent is like uh, six months has we have, we have paid an expenses for, for parents. They need not what? We need not to take a consideration that we are making the expenses for the parents. No. Like, no. Last six months of the year, ma'am? No. They don't have to stay with that expire. Exactly. And who is this? Anurag. Anurag, good job. Okay. okay. All right. I think that the last six months and all you guys are getting confused with uh, married filing separately, jointly, and all that's about the spouse. Like, uh, you know, the spouse, uh, they don't have to stay together for last six months in order. They, they should not be staying together there uh, in order to claim the status of HOH and all those things. It's not about the relatives. Okay, so then we'll just get started now. Our next unit is going to be on dependence. Again, what we have seen last chapter that if one wants to go for head of household, the first, the, the, the most beneficial status for anyone to claim. Let me start again. Are you able to see now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I was thinking I was sharing screen all this time. Okay, how about you? Can you see this dependence thing here? Okay, good. So, what we looked quickly, <coughs> sorry. Last class, we looked into HOH status. And for the purpose of HOH, you know, HOH cannot be claimed unless there is a qualifying relative or child or some dependent on that taxpayer if there is no qualifying uh, relative or dependent then that person can just go with married filing separately or see a uh, single status or whatever hoh is a special status given because the standard deduction is high there the other benefits are also there so there are certain conditions so we saw who which person can be considered as a qualifying person for HOH taxpayer. Now this is separate. We we should not confuse between those two things. Although a lot of things are, a lot of conditions are overlapping. So now we are going to see who is considered to be a dependent. The dependent can be on married filing jointly returns as well. It doesn't have to be only HOH. 
okay and or the dependent can also be on um, uh, you know on the on single person and how we can we, we can see that later usually the person will go with hoh but if the certain conditions are not satisfied they can even claim dependence on single status um, and there might be some benefits although until year 2018 irs used to give personal exemption amount also okay what does that mean that you are having if you are having two or three dependents they will have certain limit that okay you take two thousand dollar per dependent or three thousand dollar per dependent and reduce your taxable income by that much amount that used to be called personal exemption but they stopped it from 2018 onwards they stopped that rather what they did is like they they took out that clause and they said okay we are going to just increase standard deduction for everybody standard deduction was quite lower amount then they increase it to 22 23000 or 24000 so until there was an act which was passed in 2018 and they said until 2025 those uh, rules are going to be in place we don't know what is going to happen after 2025 but maybe the exemption will come back again or maybe Congress will pass another law, we don't know right now. But right now the situation is the personal exemptions are not taken. So that was another one of important reasons why we need to understand who can be the dependents, whom can we claim, what conditions need to be satisfied, because there are a good deal of tax benefits associated with that. <clears throat> so, um, so the rules, so now we are not talking about personal exemption thing and all because that's been out of picture. But still those rules are important for us to understand because there could be other credits related to it, like child tax credit. If the person is having one child, two children or three or four, whatever, you know, the, there could be more credits that they can get. And credits, again, they're like a, a credits will reduce the tax, tax right away. It's not decreasing the taxable income. So if the tax liability is $10,000, you get $2,000 as credit, the tax liability will go down to $8,000. So it's a straight away reduction of tax. Again, credit is very, very important. And people we have seen in the returns, people have got like up to five, six thousand dollars $6,000 of credit. So that's a big uh, relief in their tax liability. Then to calculate earned income credit amount. Earned income credit is, um, is basically meant for people with uh, very low income as per IRS standards. And if they have dependents, then they can, um, you know, qualify for credits from IRS. So basically, that means that if, even if they are not paying tax, IRS will give them some money back. Okay, so it's not like they're getting their tax refund back. They're getting extra money. And that's why IRS is very, very uh, cautious when you are claiming earned income credit because it's like a good deal of money going out of their pocket to taxpayer. Okay, so they just want to make sure that we are not claiming anything erroneously or, uh, you know, there's really the income is low and all. And they could even tax returns with earned income credit are more prone to audit than any other return. Child tax credit is very, very common. Everybody will get it. Earned income credit is not that common, but the earned income credit can go up to big amount like 5,000, 10,000, even you know, more than that. So they need to be very careful about it. Now, dependent status, to qualify as a dependent, the individual must be a child or a relative. If you want to take someone as a dependent, we need to first understand what is the relationship with that person. Either the person has to be a child or a relative, meaning generally child is a dependent on parents, so there is no no-brainer here. It's very regular situation. Or there could be some relatives, like parents could be there, uncle, aunt, and all staying with you, and who are uh, maybe... Uh, maybe disabled or maybe old or maybe sick and they can be considered as relatives for the purpose of claiming dependent a spouse is never considered a dependent so when you're doing married filing jointly you cannot say well my spouse is not working uh, you know so she is or he is a dependent on me that's no one says that so basically it's like you know it's a joint income whether wife is earning husband is earning doesn't matter it's considered to be joint income and the other person who is not earning uh, is not considered to be a dependent for this purpose. Okay. 
then qualifying child there are certain tests how do we know that the person is considered to be a qualifying child or not the certain test to uh, you know to to claim if that person is a dependent and when you are putting all this information in the tech software like you'll have to put the date of the birth of child you'll have to mark certain other things if the child is a student or not or if child is living with parent or not once you mark all those things there are certain question the software asks once you mark you know depending on whatever the situation is it will tell you whether the the taxpayer can get child tax credit or not or whether the child can be claimed as a dependent or not so we are not doing that manually but still we need to know the rules like why this person is coming why one of the child can come up as a dependent and the other is not coming you know for some other taxpayer the child is not coming up for the purpose of calculating child tax credit or maybe in one year we are getting child tax credit and the in the next year or uh, you know following years the taxpayer same taxpayer is not able to get those credit so what has changed maybe one of those situations have changed and that's why they are not getting child tax credit so there are four test we'll quickly go over that relationship obviously the child must be child it could it could be a step son step daughter as well and <clears throat> um even foster children for i think for hoh we saw that the foster children are not considered you know as qualified individual to take to claim hoh status but here uh steps on step daughter adopted and all any other you know any any child can be considered there has to be some relationship which irs has given adopted child also age age is very important either the person has to be below 19 or the child has to be full time student under the age of 24 if the child is above 19 under 24 then there has to be it has to be a full time student so there is a little box in our software where we have to put a check mark saying okay this person is a full time student and what is the definition of full time student like how do we how do we know right because it's not like in in us colleges have a very very flexible system in one semester you can take courses other semester you can take um, drop then again you can go they have quarter systems and all you can they can choose what all subjects they want to learn or they can push out it's not like if you are enrolled in the three year program you have to finish it in three year you can finish it in four five six years because this there the culture is different and all right the lot of kids they start earning they start taking you know part time jobs here and there and all so so what irs is given any full time student status can be given if <clears throat> the student has enrolled for 5 months in a year or if there is going through some other training course but typically 5 months the person should be full time student so if i mean we can just ask this question to the client is like you know is your child a full time student is he studying in all and for the kind of clients that we have uh, most of them will be full time only this typically happens with uh, more of american families where you know children are on their own and all once they're turned 18 19 whatever so or or families who don't have much money and also our kind of clients that typically this situation we don't usually even ask this question is your child a full time or not because if they're saying that the child has enrolled for some degree program we'll just assume that principal residence the principal place for the child should be taxpayers place only for more than half of the year so now it's quite possible that the child is staying in dormitory or in university and all and doing it but in, for this purpose the child is still considered to be the principal place of home is considered to be taxpayers residence only for this purpose not self supporting child should not be having any other income uh, otherwise if the child is having you know is or his or her own income of 30 40 50000 how can child be considered as a dependent is earning he or she is earning enough to take care of her own her or his own expenses so these are the four condition that we have to see for a qualifying child so we need to remember what is the relationship what is the age where the child is staying and the child should not be self supporting 
Uh, Ma'am, having a valid SSN number was also one of the condition, right? For uh... yeah, this will come up later. This will come up later, right? I mean, like we first we are looking into see if the principal residence. Uh, is typically, yeah, they're not talking about it, but it will come somewhere down that the child has to be a U.S. resident and all, and they need to have a valid SSN, obviously, because unless you put that SSN, you not won't be able to get the credit. Right. So ITIN will not provide credit. That's what you're trying to say, Vita? Yes. yes. Hmm. These are the four basic conditions. And then obviously the tax ID and other things have to be there. Okay, so now we'll see who is a qualifying relative. I think those conditions are common for relative and child. That's why they're not putting it here, but we'll see them somewhere down below. So who is a qualifying relative? Again, we have to see the residence test. Um, for the entire tax year. Here they are saying the residence requirement is satisfied for an individual who merely resides with a potential claimant for the entire tax year. What is the so residence we have to see? What is the relationship? There has to be some kind of blood relationship or something or some immediate relationship. And uh, then, you know, those people can be claimed as relative. The relationship need to be present to only one or one of the two married people who are filing a joint. And I mean, that's quite obvious, right? Not necessarily the child will be related to both of them. Maybe, um, maybe if it's second marriage, then the stepson, maybe it could be related or stepson or stepdaughter could be related only to wife or could be related only to husband, but they're considered to be. Uh, in a, they considered for satisfying this relationship test. Any relationship established by marriage is not treated. Okay, so that's why we are saying steps and stepdaughter are, are included for this purpose. Like just because they're divorced doesn't mean that the child is not dependent anymore. Right. So just because the person is divorced, they're marrying somebody else and all. But still, the child from the first marriage can still be considered as a dependent. Any extended relationships are included, any immediate relationships. Those things, if we are not sure, most of the relationships are here, parent, sibling, child and all, grandparents, descendants, even uncle, aunts, they are included for the purpose of qualifying relative. One of the important conditions is that they should be staying with the taxpayer. Okay, so, and as long as they are related. So if you are not sure, we can always go to the IRS website and we can see which relationships are uh, like, you know, recognized for this purpose. A cousin can be can only be claimed as a dependent if she she has lived with the taxpayer all the year and also like yeah, cousin can also be they are not talking about cousin here. They're saying uncle, aunts, ancestors, descendants and all nephews, nieces, but even cousin can be considered as long as they're staying together. Now, gross income of the individual should not be more than 4,200. Now, this is the limit for 2019. This limit might change every year by a couple hundred dollars. So we we'll need to find out what is the limit for 2022. Um, but we have to see if the person who is supposed to be claimed as a dependent is having <coughs> his or her income. And if that income is crossing certain threshold. And what they're talking about here is gross income, not net income. So any ex gross income for the gross income dependency test is all income that is received, but not exempt from tax. So basically, we are talking about rental gross income, because what they're saying is you must be having some gross income from rent, but the expenses are all legitimate. But for the purpose of this calculation, we are not considering expenses. We just have to go with the top line. What is gross income, not net income? Similarly, what is the income from business and all? So you can do gross income is like minus cost of goods sold, but not other expenses. Social security benefits are generally excluded. Municipal bond interest is generally included. Municipal bond interest is interest which is given by. Hello, ma'am. Is there something? Somebody said something? Hello, ma'am. Yes. You have a question, Divyansh? Or no, who is that? Hemant? 
Okay, we'll just continue. If you have something, then uh, maybe write it down. We'll take a break after going through these conditions, and then we can go over the questions. Okay. So what all conditions we saw here for qualifying relate, uh, relative? One is that relationship has to be satisfied, or there has to be a residence. Residence requirement. Secondly, certain amount of income, uh, they need to be below certain threshold. That is the income test. And we are seeing gross income tax. Third is support. The person, the taxpayer should have been providing more than 50% of the support. Okay, the, it's not enough that the relative is just living in the same house. There also has to be support provided, meaning you're providing flow, food, clothing, whatever, um, other things. And here, now, now don't get confused between head of household and here, because here they're talking about vacation also. What we need to, we need to understand is like whether the support is provided or not. Okay, and if there's like specific item, we can always go to the clause and we can always go to the code and look into it. Any support during the calendar year we are talking about, we are not saying that amount paid in areas and all. So if there is some due which is coming from past few years and we are saying, okay, fine, we'll, we'll like, you know, um, because you are my relative and you're a dependent, we'll just go ahead and clear off all your liabilities from previous years. That will not count as support. Support meaning regular maintenance expenses, which is needed on in day-to-day -day life. Certain items will be excluded. Obviously, if you're purchasing cars or furniture and appliances, those are big ticket items. So we will not take them as support items. Support is like only just basic food, clothing, shelter, utilities, because one cannot live without them. OK. Then uh, any amount of if an item is provided, like if you're not giving cash and all, but you're providing some other kind of support, then we usually have to see what is the fair market value. or if we have bought it and given it, like or the taxpayer is buying and giving, giving it, then we have to see what is the cost and all. Any support receive as a single amount. If there are more than one dependent, then we can just prorate it. Like if there are three children, then how much is the support? What is the total amount spent on them? We can just prorate it and all. A divorce or separated individual need not meet the support test if they are meeting the following condition. They, they provided more than 50%, their custody, okay, lived apart and all. So what they're saying is this particular condition of support will not be applicable to parents, those who are separated, as long as they are providing between both of them, if they are providing 50%, and between both of them, like if they are also doing custody and all, and they are not considered to be living together. They are not doing married filing jointly returns. Okay, and then they did not have a multiple support agreement. Multiple support agreement, what is it like? I mean, like one, it's quite possible and it's very common that the child wants to say stay with one of the parents. Let's say child wants to stay with mom only if they are separated, but dad is still paying for all the expenses. So the child is staying with one uh, parent and the other parent is paying and it could be the other way down, whatever. So here there is an exception to that. It's not like wherever the child is staying, that parent can only take the child as a dependent. They can have an agreement between them that only one of them can take the child as a dependent. And then there could be multiple support agreement, like if one person of a group that together provides more than 50% of the support, maybe the grandparents are also supporting, maybe uncle aunts are also supporting, they're all saying that, okay, you know, we will, for this child, we are supporting more than 50%. Now, who will claim the child as a dependent? Whether it will be grandparents, whether it will be, you know, one of the parents or somebody else. So we, there's something called multiple support agreement. The IRS says that you guys can discuss among yourself, come up with an agreement, and uh, according to that, you can claim the dependency. So um, these situations are not very common, but obviously we need to know. The individual must not be a qualifying child of the taxpayer or any other taxpayer alone. So, 
Okay, like this is the fourth condition. So I think we are uh, we are done with the support rules. What does support include? Like fifty percent, and what what kind of cost is considered as support, and the amounts which has to be pro provided during the calendar year. Past amounts or areas are not included for that purpose. Then, um, if the support is in kind, then how to come up with its value? If the support is provided by more than one person, then how do you like split up the amount? Or you can prorate it. And if for separated individuals, you don't even need to meet the support test. You can have an uh, like one of the one of the person, one of the spouse can claim. It doesn't have to uh, also do the residence uh, test. It doesn't have to meet that. See here, the parent having custody for more than 50% of the year is entitled, but the dependency exemption may be allocated to the non-custodial parent if there is an agreement signed and all. Then there could be multiple support and all. So we, these are all the conditions that they put under support. So what all conditions we have seen up to now for qualifying relative, there has to be a relationship or residence test. Either a relationship or residence they're saying. So we'll go over that. Either they need to stay together or they need to be there. There has to be some kind of relationship. But for cousin, it can they can be cousin can be claimed as a dependent only if the cousin is living with the taxpayer. Okay, so what they're saying is either one of two can be satisfied. Secondly, we have to can we have to um, calculate what is the gross income. Third is who is providing the support. And now fourth point is the, that person should not be claimed as a dependent himself or herself. Meaning the person who is claiming the other relative as a dependent, that person should not be a dependent of somebody else. Like if you yourself are a dependent, how can you claim another person as a dependent on your tax return? This is what they're trying to say. The individual must not be a qualifying child of somebody else and all. And if the adopting parents, they have to have an identification number. And that, that's fine. You don't need to worry about that. Okay, so these are the four conditions that we need to look into. So we have seen who can be a qualifying child, who can be a qualifying relative. And now we'll see who can be considered qualifying as a dependent. Dependent taxpayer test, if an individual meets the requirement to be classified as a dependent on another person's tax year, the individual will be treated as having no dependence for the tax year. So the, all they're trying to say is like, if you're trying to claim someone as a dependent, there has to be a basic condition that you yourself cannot be a dependent on somebody else. But there is an exception to that. You can still be a dependent and file your own return if you are just filing the return to claim refund from IRS. Filing status, an individual does not qualify as a dependent on another, another return if the individual is married. If they are doing married filing joint returns, usually they will not be considered as dependent on their parents. If, if two, like, you know, if uh, a couple is staying together, they don't have their own income, their parents want to claim them as dependent, then they cannot go with their own return of married filing jointly returns because they are being claimed as dependent on their parents' return. Only in one condition, there is an exception. If they want, if there is have been a withholding and they want to take that refund back, they can file their own return. They can qualify as a dependent and they can still file a joint return solely to claim a refund from IRS for the any tax which is being withheld. Okay, filing status. Let me just mark this. This is the first condition dependent taxpayer test, filing status. Third one is citizenship or resident. So again, the person has to be a citizen of US or a resident of US. Now, these are the general 
conditions like this is what you were talking about shweta are you there yes yes ma'am yeah so what we earlier what we saw is specific to a child what is that we need to satisfy then specific to a relative what has to be satisfied and then there are certain other general things that the person has to be a, a, a like a us person filing status cannot be married filing jointly anybody who is claiming other person as a dependent should not himself or herself be a dependent of somebody else otherwise when you are putting all this social security as dependent and all in the form it will get rejected by irs irs will send a rejection saying that you cannot claim this person as a dependent because this person is filing their own return or this person has already been claimed by somebody else there has to be a taxpayer identification number we cannot claim anybody as a dependent without getting the uh, a tax id number so if the parents are living in us with you know let's say with like they have moved from india to us and they are staying there the the taxpayer has to apply for an identification number for them in order to claim them as a dependent and the other condition they might as well be satisfying right that they are staying there they are staying in the same household or whatever we'll just quickly go over this table then we'll take a break and then we'll go over the uh, some of the examples here i think this is a good table to again just refresh what we have read here let me just go over this a taxpayer cannot claim any dependents if the taxpayer or the spouse if filing jointly could be claimed as a dependent by another taxpayer doesn't this seem to be logical right if you yourself are a dependent on someone else how can you say that there's another person who is dependent on you like the person cannot even pay his or her maintenance expense then how can that person claim somebody else as a dependent so this is a general rule a taxpayer cannot claim the married person who files a joint return as a dependent even though they could be dependent but if they are filing a joint return then they cannot be claimed as a dependent on their parents or somebody else there's only one exception they can file a return if the return is filed only to claim refund or to get money back from irs third a taxpayer cannot claim a person as a dependent unless that person is a us citizen and for that person for that purpose they are also claiming that even resident of canada or mexico can be claimed as a us person so because there is a special treaty that us has with canada and mexico they are all like very you know close by countries one in north one in south and there's like too much of traffic between these three countries people keep moving from canada to us us to canada and mexico is also very closely related to us so they have made this as an exception that if you are living in canada or mexico you can still be considered as a us person a taxpayer cannot claim a person as a dependent unless the person is a child or a qualifying relative so you cannot claim another person as a dependent unless the condition to be taken as a child or a relative are satisfied so once again what are the tests to be qualifying ch child there has to be a relationship test all these things are covered then the child must be there has to be an age test under age 19 and all but if the uh, we can even consider 24 if the child is a full time student or or the other is third part also that we didn't see earlier any age if the child is permanently or totally disabled then it doesn't matter if the child is not able to do things on his own then obviously the child is going to be it doesn't matter if the child could be 50 year old but that person would still be a dependent the child must have lived with the taxpayer for more than half of the year the child must not have provided more than half of his or her own support that means more than 50% of the support has to be borne by the taxpayer or the parent and child is not filing a joint return maybe the child is married maybe the child is 23 year old still a full time student married and is still a dependent on parents and they may want to file their joint returns 
If they are filing merit filing jointly returns, then their parents cannot claim them as a dependent. Only exception, they can still file if they just are filing just for the reason of claiming refund, no other reason. If the child meets, meets the rule to be a qualifying child for more than one person, okay. So if the both husband and wife are saying that, okay, this could be my child as well, this could, I can also take him or her as a dependent or I can also take, or maybe grandparent can also take and all, then only one person can claim the child to be a dependent. You cannot, the return will get rejected if the same assistant has been put up as a dependent in, you know, more than one return. What are the tests for a relative? The person cannot be the qualifying child for someone else. The person has to be related in some way. Or, or okay, this is important. We are looking into this residency or relationship condition, right, which we saw earlier. So either the person has to be related or the person is living with the taxpayer all year. Now here they are not staying only six months. All year, the person has to live there. And the gross income of that relative should not be more than a certain amount. And the taxpayer must provide more than half of the total support. So uh, it used to be a very important clause because there were certain exemptions that were related to the dependents. And, but now you're not getting the exemption still who can be considered as a qualifying child is very important because that child takes credits directly calculated with this information that we will be feeding in to, into the tax data. This could still be important if one is claiming earned income credit because for the purpose of claiming earned income credit, the you know uh, the rules have to check if there are who are the qualifying dependents. So when we are processing the tax return, when we are looking into that, we always in the very first page on 1040, there will be information given that who are the dependents on your returns. Okay, typically, generally, there will be only parents or children, even not parents, because most of our clients are like, you know, uh, they're like Indian families, those who have moved to US and all, the, usually parents are staying back in India, but they can definitely click. Or it's very uncommon, but we have seen one or two returns where even uncle and aunt were claimed as dependents. So there were certain conditions that they were satisfying, that they were living with them, the taxpayers were providing support and all those things. If they were satisfied, then they can be claimed as qualified relative for the purpose of claiming dependents. Now, IRS could definitely, they, they could very well send a notice saying that you prove that this person is a dependent. So we need to be able to provide address proof, some other proof that this person was actually living in the same house, or there has to be a proper relationship which needs to be proved, and and some kind of uh, again records to say that more than fifty percent of the uh, expenses for that person has been incurred by taxpayer. Okay, any questions? We'll take a break here. Let's go over all these conditions once again. Any questions? We can go over that. Otherwise, once we go over these uh, examples, that also makes it very clear who can be considered as dependent. Any questions? No, ma'am. No? Whether anything from your end, Tanya? Okay, let's just start going through that. Um, which is the first one? This one only, no? Yes. So they are just putting it like this so to, you know, to increase the confusion here. We're talking about qualifying relative. This is definitely important for qualifying relative, right? If you go to the table, they are giving that the relative should not have the person's gross income should be less than this, 4,200. Okay. Okay. So, so one condition is satisfied. The other is not because his income is higher than the limit given by IRS. 
So even though Doris is paying more than half of Ellen's support or whatever, Ellen is not considered as a dependent. So uh, for the purpose of 1040, that person, like uh, this person, Alan cannot be put up as a dependent and he cannot take any tax benefit. Doris will not be able to take any tax benefit. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, so this is an exception we already talked about. If usual, generally, if like, you know, uh, the taxpayer are filing joint return. So the daughter and son-in-law, if they're filing joint return, they will, uh, their parents would not be able to claim them as dependents. But they are filing the joint return only to get refund, then that's fine. And obviously, uh, the parents are providing full support for their married daughter and son-in-law who lived with them all year. So they are truly a dependent. Okay, but one of the condition is that they should not file their own return. So that's fine. They are not filing and they are not even required to file a return. But there have been some withholding. They don't have any income. So they should be able to get all the withholdings back from IRS. And that's why they are filing. That is allowed. And in that case, the kind, I mean, these people, they may still claim the daughter and son-in-law as dependents. Okay, um, Divyansh, next. Yes, ma'am. Resident Alliance living in the US. Resident Alliance living in the US provide all support for their four minor child children. Even, even they all live with the various relative in the other countries. One is in Mexico, two others are in Canada, and uh, the fourth is in Chile. 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 All family members are citizens of Chile. The resident alliance may claim aliens. exemption. Aliens may claim. May claim dependent exemptions for only the three children residing in Mexico and Canada. Correct, because for this purpose they are including any person um even like they are including even canadian or mexican resident but the person should be US. should be it should be having the us uh, tax identification number okay chile is not included in their list so because they don't have a treaty with chile or not so that's that's fine they can still claim even though the children are not living with them um and they are living in other countries they can still be claimed and all family members are citizen of chile they're saying but they're resident aliens so they don't have to be citizen of us they can be resident resident alien meaning they can be like they can just be resident as well they can be per a green card holder or they can just be on visa staying in us or us tax resident Okay, that's it. Yes, is it clear now or is it very confusing? Rohit? Yes, ma'am. What do you think? Are you are you able to grasp it? Yes, ma'am. Uh Vanna Bhavani, you guys are not responding much, huh? Heman Sai. Understood, ma'am. Okay, what time is it? Six o'clock. Okay, we just end it here. Next, uh, this is about 1.4. We have like two more small units to cover, then we'll be done with first chapter. So we'll go with 1.5 later. Okay, returns of dependence. Here we will see certain condition, like if their income is crossing certain limits, then they have to file their own returns. And what are those limits and all? We have already like talked about it a little bit that we have to see what is the standard deduction if they're crossing that they may have to file their own return there's something called kiddie tax kiddie tax is very common for rich people because they try to you know push out their income to their children by giving certain gifts and all and uh, especially unearned income 
Okay, earned income, we are not talking about, so only interest, dividend, those kind of income, they'll pass it on in their kid's name. But what Kiritex does is they, uh, you know, even though the kid is not having very high income, but it will still get taxed at the highest rate uh, for the parent or for the parent's marginal rate, it gets taxed. So there's no saving for that. And this is what IRS is intending to do. This is usually kiddie tax and all we see for like ultra rich people and all. Yeah, okay, that's a very small chapter. We'll do that next time now. Tomorrow, I don't know if we get time tomorrow, we'll quickly go over. Maybe this will not even take half an hour. We can finish this off. Okay, all good. So we'll close it here.